Okay. We're, re we're re recording. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin O'Brien and this is the YR World Web and Interview Series. Pardon me. And today we're joined by Nikkez. Sorry, I don't know. Uh, Nikkez, is that right? Yes, Nikkez Ishimwe. Uh, and you're joining us from Dublin, but you are from Rwanda originally, is that correct? Yes, originally from Kigali in Rwanda, yeah. Okay, just give us a little bit of an elevator pitch, an introduction to yourself about what you're doing. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. So as I was saying, my name is Nikkez Ishimwe. And I was born and raised in Rwanda, lived there around 17 years old, uh, traveled in a number of countries, including Algeria, France, and um, you know, now living in Ireland. Um, so I'm working as a quality assurance engineer uh, for Amazon. I work on uh, Alexa, the Alexa platform, mainly on um, aspects related to internationalization and how uh, to make sure that the international experience of um, users, uh, of our international users in non ENUS markets uh, is quite correct and making sure that you know all the um, language aspects, but cultural, but also linguistic, cultural, and uh, geographical aspects of interacting with that solution uh, are catering to the needs and to the, you know, to, to the right um, understanding of people in those countries. And on the other side, I'm working with a number of uh, nonprofit organizations that are um, mainly focused, like my focus is uh, being an advocate for diversity and inclusion. So I'm part of Women in Tech Africa, which is a nonprofit organization founded in Ghana, but then which uh, actually is operating in a number of uh, countries in Africa and even beyond. I, I, I'm operating in Ireland as part of it as well, as a chapter lead, but also part of the um, the board of that organization and our aim is uh, basically to empower and to uh, foster um, the leadership of African women in technology. So we want to develop a young generation, but not only the young one, but the current one to be really technology leaders on the continent. And one aspect that we are focusing on is entrepreneurship. So making sure that that those technology skills and uh, the expertise or experiences that they gained when working or when studying in those aspects of uh, technology in general, uh, they can apply them to actually um, start businesses that, uh, you know, enterprises, because one of the main needs that we have on the continent is around jobs and, you know, uh, finding solutions to the needs that we have in the societies. So that's one of the area that we are focusing on. And I'm part of other, you know, organizations like, you know, um, uh, SheApps, which is a, 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 a recently created organization that aims also to elevate uh, global women tech entrepreneurs, uh, mainly by working with different partners to facilitate access to key resources that they may need to thrive as uh, entrepreneurs. And on the other side, I'm working also with uh, the African uh, Professionals Network in Ireland, where our uh, main goal is to ensure that the professionals that are coming to Ireland or that are already based in Ireland are of African descent are thriving professionally. So um, developing opportunities, events, and platforms for them to connect, to grow, to learn, but also to collaborate with uh, others in order to, you know, to grow in their careers and in their businesses when they have businesses. So that's a little bit about myself. I've been living here in Ireland for um, almost six years now. Uh, yeah, so quite becoming a little bit of Dubliner, but <laughs> loving it, yeah. Good stuff. There's a, lo a lot of interesting stuff there. First off, actually, let's just talk about your career journey. First off, you like yeah. a, like in university, what, what did you study and, you know, what was your career path? What brought you to Ireland? What was the what was the journey? Yeah, so uh, as I was saying, I was raised in Rwanda, so I studied there, and um, I don't know, some of you might know the history of Rwanda, we kind of went through 
uh, a bad uh, period yeah. and fortunate circumstances where there was a genocide against the Tutsis and uh, which affected actually, you know, the whole country, not only in terms of many lives lost, but also in terms of infrastructure uh, lost and, you know, everything was to be rebu rebuilt from scratch. And I was young at the time and studying in, uh, in primary school. And I remember growing up, I was like, I want to be, you know, because I could see people around me, you know, the grown up people, everyone was working towards recreating our societies in uh, any way they could help. So I wanted to grow finding a solution to some of the problems that we had. And I remember, so I was interested in uh, science, maths, you know, uh, physics, uh, you know, th those kind of stuff. But unfortunately, I couldn't see the use of those um, areas within, you know, my immediate uh, surroundings. So I remember doing secondary school, learning about some of the things, but not finding a practical use to it. And uh, when I was about to finish secondary school, uh, it was at that, that time that the first mobile phones came into the country. And uh, also that actually maybe there had been already some mobile phones before, but that was the moment that you know it started spreading. And that's when I started realizing that, that they were there. And I was like, wow, that's a really cool technology. And I can understand how people can communicate without you know having a wire between their two phones. That was something that brought curiosity within me. And at the same time, there was internet also starting to bloom uh, a little bit. Um, I remember we would go to those cyber cafes to try to, to you know, to, to, to connect. I remember we would have only 30 minutes because it was a little bit costly, but within 30 minutes, you wouldn't do much, but I was so curious to learn about how it works. And that's how I actually learned that some of those mobile phones are, happy, are helping doctors to intervene and to, to talk to, you know, um, at the doctors in other hospitals. And I was like, wow, uh, maybe this area is something I can apply my skills into and, uh, you know, try to find something that might help in some ways uh, uh, solving some of the issues that we had in the country. Um, so I was then interested in the area of telecommunications, uh, but the university that we had there, um, I didn't find that field specifically. So I got an opportunity to get a scholarship to go to uh, study um, uh, science and technologies with, you know, uh, the aim to do telecommunications in the last years in Algeria. Uh, so I lived in Algeria for about two years. Um, it was a great experience, like great learnings, like uh, I think the first foundations of, you know, uh, the aspects of technologies that I didn't know about, for instance, you know, I uh, had never learned about programming and didn't know much about it. And, uh, you know, that's where I started receiving the first foundations, though it was quite theoretical. So everything was in writing. I remember we would just, you know, uh, if you, we are asked to create a program to do something or a simple script, we would do it in writing. We would, you know, there were a few um, labs where we could go to use a computer and the computers were not enough and even the time wasn't enough for the number of you know students that were there and uh, so in the end it was quite a good experience I would say as a foundation but then um, uh, circumstances made it that I had to leave because um, on the social side I wasn't feeling like in the right place. Uh, I think it was more just a cultural difference with the, you know, compared to what I was living in Rwanda and then finding yourself as a young person in a new society where you have no family member and, you know, uh, sometimes though the community like the other uh, students we had come together were quite a good, like they became family to us and, you know, some of the people were quite welcoming, but still some you know some people in the society were not used to see for instance black people and you know sometimes it wasn't that a great experience mm. and i decided to leave after two years and i came uh, to france um 
So and in France, I, um, I got the opportunity to integrate uh, uh, an engineering school, uh, which is the Institute of uh, National Applied Sciences in France. And I uh, got the opportunity to actually choose the option that I wanted, telecommunications. Uh, so I studied there for uh, three years and got my master's in telecommunications, looking at mainly uh, the aspects of, you know, uh, networking networks, mobile networks, and then on the other side, we would have aspects of software development, though it wasn't the main focus, but, you know, those go together. And, you know, that's where I got actually to really then start practicing my, you know, my uh, programming skills, I would say. So like, that's where I started learning my first languages, uh, like Java, like, you know, Python. Um, and then it was a great school because, you know, everything had to be applied through projects. And we had like many internships. By the time I finished, I had done uh, something like, uh, one year and three months of internships. So it was really a great experience that, you know, helped me apply all the skills that I had learned. And in the same time, discover actually that this is an area that keeps changing a lot, where you need to keep up to date. And that, you know, uh, I knew that going there, I wouldn't be bored at all because there will still always be something to do. Um, so when I finished my studies there, First opportunity I got was within um, a company called Embedia, where I worked as a software developer and uh, was the first experience with mobile development within, uh, within uh, uh, an organization. And uh, my task was to actually migrate one of their uh, application, which was uh, what was to be actually migrated to support, you know, the .NET framework for uh, Windows phones. At the time, we thought that Windows phones will be, you know, thriving. Uh, so did that for six months, uh, quite a great experience, but then it was a startup and, you know, um, the circumstances made it that that project, you know, once we we delivered the application, uh, they had to move on to other projects, so I had to uh, to leave. And then um, I integrated another company called Alstom in France, which works, uh, which operates railways and uh, ra they, they have, they operate trains actually. Mm -hmm and a number of uh, trains across different countries. So I worked on one of the modules that sits on the, um, and the train that helps monitor the train metrics, but also uh, helps uh, manage all the communications within the train. So within the train, but also between the train and uh, the, the board, the monitoring systems on the ground. Uh, so I uh, worked on the aspects of GSMR, which is GSM for railways. Uh, and that's where actually I discovered the, the role of uh, a quality assurance engineer. Uh, so my main role was on developing, you know, the solutions that we are using for monitoring, but mainly actually validating that they are working uh, well from a user experience, uh, from uh, a functional perspective, like that it does comply to all the requirements that have been set by uh, the regulators, the, the, the customers, but also in terms of security, compliance, ISO, and stuff like that. So um, it wasn't purely a technical role, I would say, that allowed me also to discover different areas of, you know, uh, uh, developing a product. Because at the time when I entered, for me, it was, you know, you develop something, you develop, you focus on your code, you deliver, and that's it. But that opened my mind to actually different other uh, roles that can be, you know, uh, that can surround the product development. So worked there for three years and a half. And at the time, I, you know, I was in France, we were speaking French, but I knew in my mind I was coming from Rwanda. And I've still always been connected to the country and felt like, you know, I need to contribute, even though I'm here, I feel like I need to be able to contribute. So I knew that English is one of the main language and I'm part of the generation that in Rwanda studied French uh, till actually I finished my secondary school and then they changed to English as the 
main teaching language. So I didn't get the chance to practice uh, as I would have needed the English. And I knew that if I wanted to contribute to any actions in Rwanda, or if I wanted to go back to Rwanda, I needed to be fluent somehow in that language. So I was looking for opportunities to go um, to apply to, to do a professional experience in an English speaking country. And um, that's where I learned about Ireland, to be honest, <laughs> because it's such a small country that sometimes it we you know we don't think about it so i was targeting us canada uh england but you know i realized that actually ireland was quite close and uh, there was an opportunity uh, that was actually given by one of the french entity called ub france which allows young people to travel and to uh to develop their experience internationally um, so i went into that organization and got an opportunity with the french company uh, called Sane, they are called MOVIS, they change their name, and they operate a uh, free flow um, tolling systems. So they are the ones that operate the M50 uh, road for a uh, toll road, uh, for instance. So I uh, joined the team and I uh, was working as still as um, quality assurance, but also uh, doing some aspects of technical, uh, it, I was an application specialist, basically. So some of the applications that they were using, uh, knowing the technical implementations, engaging with uh, the customers to ensure that you are uh, meeting the requirements, but also doing some aspects of quality assurance to make sure that we are delivering uh, a product that has good quality. Um, so worked there for um, something like uh, two years and a half, almost three years. And um, recently, my mission, when my mission was completed, because I was still linked to the French entity, then uh, I was like, you know, now I have the opportunity to either go back to Rwanda, go back to France, or stay here in Ireland. But to be honest, when I arrived in Ireland, I kind of, you know, um, felt like at home. I don't know, like it. There, there was something that reminded me so much of Rwanda, like uh, especially uh, the way people welcomed me, the warmth that people have, the way that they're so approachable and it's easy to make connections here. And then uh, on the other side, the, the nature and the landscape somehow reminded me of my country. So uh, the two years felt like they weren't enough and I was like, I want to get more of this. So. Uh, I looked for opportunities around here and I got the chance to uh, find a role within Amazon working as um, on Alexa, as again, as a quality assurance engineer. Uh, so I'm, I'm focusing on the software aspects of the platform and uh, that has been a good area because, you know, um, it was the first time I'm working with uh, AI related products and trying, you know, learning about new concepts around natural language understanding. So about speech recognition, you know, that kind of thing. So it was a good opportunity for me to um, to to go into and to step into something new and, and you know keep on learning and with still you know the objective to be able to see where can what what I learn uh, where can I apply it to uh, help in other areas whether being in Ireland in Europe or in Africa yeah good stuff yeah. tell us that's yeah. a, 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 a very interesting uh, career path there. Uh, just actually something you mentioned that you're involved in localization. I'm very interested in that subject, partly yeah. because something I feel about it is, is that it's a subject where uh, uh, somebody would utilize a lot of cultural knowledge. Would that be correct to say? That it would necessitate cultural knowledge, yes. Well, yeah. Yes, definitely. So culture is one of the key aspects, uh, I think, of localization and actually globalization uh, in general. So um, because I think as developers or even as you know, product builders, sometimes we tend to focus on the language aspect. Uh, but by experience, you know, um, the way you say something, especially for products that actually are related to languages and to mm. 
capturing what the user says or what interpreting the understanding of the user. I think it's really important to make sure that, you know, the content that you are localizing is given in a way that doesn't offend that culture or doesn't, you know, yeah. something different because sometimes it's so simple, like, you know, for Spanish, you can say a word in uh, the yeah. Spanish from Spain that is going to mean completely something different in the Spain from, you know, a South American country. And that might be in some ways interpreted in either, you know, a hurtful way or either have a completely different meaning. So it's good to have that, you know, understanding. And then that's why, like for me, as someone who has worked in that area, I think that it's important to involve people from different countries yeah. when we are building products. So it comes to the aspects of diversity that I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, because I think, you know, like there are so many products being developed. And um, of course, given, you know, the interest that the person who is developing the product or the organization that is developing the product or the market share that they are targeting, they might just focus on one area. But when from the beginning, uh, it is made sure that we are developing something that can cater for different cultures, for different geographies, for different languages, or at least that we have that, you know, separation between, you know, what we built, the core, uh, functionalities, make sure that it would be easy to localize it or to cater it for a different country. It's something really important and crucial for, I think, any uh, any product builders. Because, you know, in the end, it will not cost much if you had that mindset from the beginning that you need to develop something that can cater for different um, cultures. Uh, but also on the other side, I think it's good because you know that, you know, it won't cost that much and it will be something that will be easily exported to, uh, to, to other areas. Yeah. That's right. You know, it's a very interesting subject to mine because I, I feel that a lot of people don't realize that subjects like university subjects like Spanish or French or all those sort of or, or graphic design or history of art have very useful applications in a tech career that you know that's something to remember that you can mm -hmm. that's a yeah. very interesting subject for anyone uh, so just actually tell me about your role with the women in tech africa chapter in ireland mm -hmm. yes yeah, so so when i integrated women in tech africa um at the at the beginning i had started gathering a community of women who work in the technology sector here um, and not necessarily from africa i just wanted to to co connect because we are you know i think it's already known by many people that you know women in the tech sector are quite a minority and we face challenges when we enter you know to enter the field but also to grow in the field and to to really thrive in the the field um so i wanted just to make connections on a personal level to, to build a community that i can rely on and that you know like we can learn from each other um but then um that's where like while doing that work of connecting with people, I was also exploring different organizations that have the same kind of vision. And that's where I come across Women in Tech Africa, who was founded by someone called Ethel Kofi. Uh, she's based in, uh, in Ghana, and she was living in the UK, went back to the continent to help with the development of her country, but felt that there needed to be um, a community of uh, women in tech across the continent to work together to see how they can develop themselves. So uh, when she founded the, co the company, um, the objective and like the, the key mission is really to see how we can be technology leaders. And that goes through three main uh, aspects that we work on. So uh, first, we want to ensure that we spark the interest of young um, girls into the areas of STEM in general, but also technology in particular. So we want to make sure that they are aware actually that those fields exist, that they understand what it takes to go there, and that they can connect with role models in those areas so that they can learn actually, you know, what are the types of jobs available, uh, what type of studies can I go to get there, do to go, 
do to get there, uh, but also to understand, you know, like the practicalities of like getting hands on experiences on some of uh, the aspects like if you are talking about technology coding uh is it possible to to have like you know small hands-on experiences where they can see what it looks like so in that area what we've been doing is uh through our chapters what we call chapter is basically we have an entity within each uh, country where we operate where there is a leader and they try to organize events um you know that, that go along uh, our missions and those uh, three points that I'm going to mention. So one of the area that we focus on is training and, you know, um, um, having those events where young girls can come um, have some career guidance if possible, or have some hands-on experience on aspects of, you know, learning to code, for example. So that's one of the area. And then the other area that we uh, focus on as part of our mission is to um, enable women who are already in this tech area uh, to feel like they're in the right place and that they, are, they can thrive in this place. So um, what we've seen is that, you know, there is, uh, I don't know if I, call, I can call it an attrition, but we've seen that of course, we have a few women anyway graduating from uh, you know STEM related studies, but when they choose to go into uh, technology roles, we've seen that there is a dropout. At some point, there are many that choose to leave completely the field and to go into other areas, either to go into non technical roles or to go completely in other areas. And we were trying to understand what is causing that. And, you know, many um, feedback that we would get would be that, you know, we face challenges around, you know, feeling that we are in the right place. So the part of the imposter syndrome that, you know, many women feel it whenever they arrive in this area, um, they feel like, you know, first it's male dominated the industry and then, you know, uh, depending on the environment, sometimes it can be uh, hard for them to feel in their place and to feel whether they deserve to be there. Where well, we know that we are capable and we know that we deserve to be there, uh, but sometimes it can be a challenge. So we that you know that aspect of our mission is to enable platforms that can allow women to see what can how can we behave in those you know circumstances and what can we do to change uh, uh, so that the environment becomes an environment that allows those women to thrive so we work on the aspects of you know empowering them uh, through talks so we bring in role models through events where we try to talk about how those who thrive did they manage it and then we talk we try to not only bring women but also men working in those areas so that we can talk about the challenges that are there you know sometimes there are stereotypes sometimes there are you know some misconceptions not misconceptions but you know even sometimes that you know an environment a work environment can create that don't allow someone to express themselves as they should do uh, or to um to thrive as they should do so we try to kind of bring conversations around those aspects to see how as you know an industry we can create an environment that allows women to thrive and then the third mission uh links to what i was talking to you at the beginning that the ultimate goal that we have is that um, you know, those skills and this technology that we get, we get to use it into building practical solutions that bring solutions to the continent. So I don't know if you know, but in Africa, there are many women entrepreneurs, and that's because there are many needs and there are many problems that need to be solved. Mm. The good thing is that women, they are not afraid to step in when they can. But what happens is most of the time that either they are lacking the skills or they are lacking the resources to get them started. So uh, we are working on that area of technology entrepreneurship to build first the skills. So we've been working with uh, some government organization or even some other nonprofit organization to organize, you know, camps or boot camps where, where uh, you know, women can come and learn about entrepreneurship itself on one side and then on the other side we are looking at you know 
how can we use technology to enable the women entrepreneurs who are already there to thrive their businesses? So some women would have actually businesses that are local, that you know are not online, and build, building that digital literacy and digital knowledge allows them actually to thrive. Like one example is, uh, you know, there are many who sell like small products here and there. And um, one thing that we've seen is that with the development of mobiles in Africa, you know, people now know that, you know, you can use mobile money to pay and, you know, like the, the but that some of them didn't necessarily maybe have that knowledge how can they set up you know the accounts to, to receive money from the clients and so on so those are the kind of aspects that we uh, we try to work on and to see how we can you know you know build that knowledge or if it's already there how can we build other digital uh, skills that help that can help them develop yeah so those are the three areas but in general is to see how you know it can bring the technology to be an enabler to development on the continent. Good stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Just actually, just a sort of like, um, uh, there, there's a big um, diaspora, African diaspora community in the tech community in Ireland. Yeah. Have you encountered, have you come across many people yet who are like Irish, but of African, of the African diaspora? There's a lot of them like uh, born in the late 90s, early 2000s, and they're they're becoming uh, they're just coming out of university now, graduating. Have, have you like um, an, any sort of encounters with them or like has that been part of your journey uh, with Women in Tech Africa? Yes, definitely. So that's like the goal of us having chapters even in countries that are not based in Africa is to engage the diaspora. So mm. um, uh, as part of Women in Tech Africa, so um, I was trying to, to have like appro approximately four events in the year where the idea is not only to, you know, to meet and to, to, to build that community and to empower each other, but also to see how we can work together to, you know, as members of the diaspora to see how, what, what contribution we can make to develop to the development of our countries and how can we help other fellow women in tech on the continent. So through those events, I have had the chance actually to meet uh, many women in tech who are part of the diaspora. Um, and then on the other side with the African Professionals Network in Ireland, um, which is comprised of actually many uh, many African people of African descent, some of them having lived here, as you say, for more than 30 years, which mm. is quite good because, you know, you get a range of people from, you know, yeah. with different experiences living here with different skills, but also like, you know, and knowing that it, it's a great platform, I think, to meet people who know you know, what the Irish society has to offer. Sometimes yeah. we get to communicate and know that, okay, there's this organization that can support this initiative that we are looking into. So it's been quite uh, good. And um, I would say the African diaspora community here is anyway quite open to these things, to these events. So whenever like DAP and I, the African Professional Network Island had events, we had like many people really uh, you know, um, interested in coming together and connecting and learning together. Good stuff. Um, that's a that's a great uh, answer there. Um, just actually, I'll sort of um, switch over to visa issues because uh, about three or four years ago, there was a major visa issue of people attending NURIPS in Canada. Timnet, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Timnet Gebru, who's uh, currently in the uh, in the news again, sort of had a terrible time trying to get into Canada. So that is that sort of raised the issue and raised uh, awareness about the whole visa, uh, issue of visas, particularly for African scientists and technologists. Mm -hmm. What was your journey there? What was your experience of that? Or what was your perception of that? Um, issue like? I think the visa issue, it's quite like, it's an issue that is there for sure. And um, I think, uh, what happens most of the time is that, you know, sometimes 
different, you know, each country have their own rules and their conditions for people to enter the country. But the aspect of the visas is a quite subjective one. So, you know, you can meet all the conditions that have been outlined, but still not get the visa. And sometimes it's at the appreciation of the, you know, embassy that is doing the assessment uh, that decides that. And all, I feel like most of the refusals for scientists, for instance, like going to conferences or mm. going to events, like by experience, by experience, I'm speaking, you know, based yep. on the people that I've talked to, most of the time will be like, we can't confirm whether you are not going to stay in the country and whether you'll be back. So it's based on an assumption because, you know, those people demonstrate that they have ties within, you know, the country, that they are still studying or they are still working, that, you know, they have ties, but um, sometimes it's not enough to prove that the person will be back. Right. Um, and which is sometimes understandable because, to be honest, as an African also living here, I know a few people who come with, you know, those ties, but they still decide to stay here because of different conditions. So sometimes it's because of, you know, uh, the conditions that they are living in that might be quite poor or like that may be security related. So. Uh, when they arrive here, it's actually the chance that they got to escape and it's, you know, they can't go back. But I think in any case, um, I think countries or the, those embassies need to develop a better framework in actually um, defining, you know, how can we make sure that these people who come, they go back. So like developing a solution because Obviously, these developed countries have the means to, you know, to work with those conference organizers, to work with the hotels where they are staying. I'm not saying that they would, you know, keep, uh, you know, the people where they are, but, you know, th there is a way to make sure that, you know, these people who come, they get that understanding that, you know, it's for their own good if when they get a visa for one week, it's only one week and then they have to go back. So there's a part of education that is needed mm. um, on both sides. I'm saying also on the people who apply for visas because the few that choose to stay here are the ones who tarnish the image of, you know, those good scientists who would like to come for a few days, but, mm. uh, you know, go back to the country. So it's a quite a tricky um, one. But to be honest, I think that there is still more work to be done by embassies to, yeah. you know, to make sure that they open up because like most of those scientists, like they give, they give really good proof that they are, you know, they will yeah. be back and they are needed there. But, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sometimes it's hard to, to convince. Yeah. yeah, it seems to me that even getting a visa, even a, a successful visa application requires a huge amount of time and a huge amount of cost. Yeah. And, and without that. knowing that you're going to get it, and it does not strike me as a very good system. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's everywhere, though. And then it yeah. depends on each country, to be honest. But I believe on that side also our, you know, the different countries need to work together. Like mm. if I know that, for example, Rwanda is one of the countries that is really working on that area, making sure that they develop partnerships with other countries uh, to make sure that, you know, the conditions to uh, enter different countries are made as easy as possible. So for instance, you know, someone of uh, a European, uh, if you have a European passport, you can go to Rwanda without a visa at the beginning. You can get a visa at the airport and yeah. then lower the cost to make the visa really uh, less costly. So I feel like it should be, you know, if those partnerships happen, then it should be the same the other way. Yeah, yeah. Rwanda yeah, yeah. Right here would be, you know, not uh, need much to enter. And then um, I think also within the African countries, that's something that has started developing where the conditions become, you know, less complicated or less heavy for people to, you know, to, 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 to be able to get visas and to travel. Um, so, and then, it can be even tailored. Like if we say that, you know, for um, uh, scientists and the tech community, maybe there is a way as, as you know, community 
uh, how do you say, community groups to work with these governments to see if there is a way to develop, you know, uh, facilitated conditions for people, scientists to travel mm -hmm. within countries. And I think it actually helps, like, you know, when applying for a visa, if you are backed by the community or the conference organizer that is welcoming you, yeah. uh, it actually facilitates the whole process and can make it easier. But I, I agree with you, we still have work to do even, you know, for the, 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 the delays that it takes, sometimes it's not really, you know, understandable how it can take that much long. And for certain conferences, you know, it's only for a few days, but you get the visa long after the, <laughs> the conference was due. So it's, yeah, we, we still have work to do. It's a very unpleasant system. I don't, I, I, unfortunately, I don't think it's improving. But uh, one thing that has happened actually is that the COVID crisis has struck and this has created a lot of online events and participation is now virtual, which yeah. in theory would make it more accessible to people in Africa. What's your perspective on that? Has that happened or is other issues like arisen like internet access? Um, yeah, so I think actually this pandemic has demonstrated that, you know, if you want, we can make things easier. <laughs> you know, these conferences and these events can happen online, um, but there are still barriers, as, yeah, as you can say. Um, so for me, like my experience for the past year where I've been trying to either attend or, you know, uh, organize events online, one of the things comes to, um, to the time differences. Sometimes, you know, um, you, you can, cut to all the time zones basically yeah. um but you know people who are interested actually in a given event sometimes they make it possible to be available even if it's too late so uh, that that has been one of the challenge but that can be easily i would say easily um addressed because you know now we have the possibility to record the events and to make sure that they can be available afterwards to people so that's one of the things that can be used to to do that and then there is that aspects of the internet connectivity i agree that it's it's quite a hard one because like speaking of africa in general there have been many advances in terms of you know um uh, enabling access to technology, even to, to, to um, you know, uh, aspects of connectivity, even in rural areas. Um, but that tends to be mostly around mobile. Um, so most of the people will be using their mobile phones, which yeah. sometimes doesn't, it's not ideal, you know. There's yeah. some, uh, some, you know, uh, like if you are attending via Zoom, maybe it's going to be possible, but if you are using different platforms, sometimes it can be challenging. And then when we are talking about these events, most of them would come with, you know, um, the videos enabled, which is going to imply much bandwidth in terms of, you know, whoever is watching that event, even in terms of participation, the delays. Yeah. I know that. For instance, when I'm communicating with people in Rwanda, it can be quite easy, but it can easily break and um, reliability is still an issue. And that's something that maybe mobile networks need still to work on, on uh, in these countries, even in terms of price and access, it's costly actually for the people over there. Because, you know, like whenever there is two more, you know, uh, mega gigabytes involved in, you know, mm -hmm videos and so on this can be quite challenging for some people to be able to access them so i feel like actually this time is a time where then these mobile networks actually can do i don't know you know sometimes it takes um it takes you know like there are more and more people now using these mobile technologies to connect yeah means that the operators are getting more people and more uh clients i would say so on the other side i feel like maybe they have an opportunity to do an effort in lowering the prices or making sure that this becomes best in infrastructure yeah people, yeah um yeah so i think those are the main ones i'm trying to think like what could prevent um yeah i think there are quite the main ones uh, I, although i feel like maybe governments also need to push in certain countries to yeah. make sure that um, 
the lacks of coverage in terms of connectivity are addressed. Uh, I'm talking not only in terms of mobile access, but also uh, in terms of like normal internet, because I feel like in Africa we've leapfrogged, uh, you know, now most of the people would use phones, uh, whether they, they don't even maybe have internet or like the, the landline phone, they, you know, we've, we've gone a step ahead, but mm. for certain things like when you are talking about technology uh, I'm thinking of the aspects like learning you know I get some cousins calling me living in Rwanda in certain areas and to be able to connect to use for instance you know to run their code on one server they they still need to use their computer right and their computer can't connect to internet they need to use their mobile phone as the access point for to be able to access the you know uh, the, the internet, which makes things a bit slower then because they, you know, yeah. download time and, you know, all the, um, the access is not as smooth as someone who would have been there. So I feel like the governments need to invest in those areas because it's key. Like it's not yeah. a, this pandemic that is creating it, but even for the future, if you want to, uh, you know, to have more uh, technology, uh, users, but technology leaders as well in, on the continent, we need to make sure that there is accessibility. So um, in Rwanda, for instance, there are projects to make sure that, you know, fiber optics are uh, spread across different areas, but um, it's, we are not there yet. We, we still have work to do in many forms and, you know, I'm talking even internet, but there are countries where we are talking even the electricity because many people mm. don't have electricity and you can't access to internet for a long time if you don't have electricity at you know at your door so we want to ensure we need to ensure coverage and i feel that sometimes the the effort the money the investment is going into other things than the basics that are quite needed so um yeah sometimes we need to change that that's a, yeah, a lot of the very, very interesting sort of at, at points you raise there. Uh, let's just actually sort of just as a zero uh, spe uh, focus in on Rwanda. How has the Rwandan tech industry grown over the last 10 or 15 years? Uh, 10 or 15 years. Like if I compare from the time when I left, I was telling you that I used to for using internet, I needed to go to a Siba cafe or to a university to be able to access internet. Um, maybe there were, I don't know, few people having a phone in my family or, um, but actually the situation has changed quite a lot over the past years. So there were a number of uh, projects that were implemented. Like I think one of the things um, was uh, around making Kigali, which is the capital city, actually a hub of, you know, like technology actually. So um, uh, there, there is a focus that has been put around education. So making sure that um, technology areas are taught in universities and actually developing an environment that enables other universities whether being foreign universities or internal ones, or even people who want to invest in that area to start, you know, uh, schools and to, to start educating in those areas. So we have, for example, the Carnegie Mellon University from the US, which is now has an entity in Rwanda, which is actually uh, has had promotions and people coming from different countries coming to study there and, getting the same kind of uh, trainings as the ones that students in the US in the same renowned university are getting and graduating with the same skills and are already ready for the local market and the international market. So that's one of the things that has been quite interesting. There's the African Leadership University as well, who was implemented there and even the Rwandan University who uh, started making a focus to ICT and technology in general uh, with more people being, you know, trained in those areas. And then on the other side, they, um, they've started uh, and started, actually it's been already a number of years where there is a focus on entrepreneurship. And that's something that is really um, being not 
it's being promoted really like you know everyone you talk with they are they have entrepreneurship in mind and they're trying to find you know how can i uh, find a solution so there are a number of hubs that have been put in place like i can talk about k lab for example which is kigali lab which has hosted a number of startups but also there are blooming startups from everywhere coming to you know to develop their operations from Rwanda because it's a, a, Rwanda has made it easy for people to start businesses over there. I think you can register your business in less than a day and then you can start operating and uh, the conditions, the tax systems mm. make it easier for people to start. And then, you know, maybe uh, like the conditions are not as heavy as they, they they used to be, which allows people to, you know, to start businesses over there. So I can talk about an example of, you know, Kasha, which is uh, uh, one of the startups that I saw um, coming there, uh, which actually aims at, you know, they deliver women products uh, to people and it's bloomed like, it started, you know, there were maybe a few people, now they have a number of people uh, that are working there. Uh, there's another startup called Hey Hey, which is looking at e-commerce and which is making sure that, especially in this time of the pandemic, that people receive, you know, their groceries or anything else that they are looking for, and which are enabling even, you know, the, the developing frameworks and tools that allow other businesses to sell their products online and that's growing um, so i think enabling that startup community to start and making it easier for people to think entrepreneurship it has helped in any way to develop that tech part uh, yeah which is really good and then the other aspects is connectivity as i was saying you know uh, the emphasis on fiber optics and making sure that you know um, especially the big areas like administrations or uh, schools or hospitals or like those main entities to be connected and to have faster access to internet is one of the solutions. And then the other things they've been focusing on are around uh, mobile access, you know, that getting that coverage all around the country and making sure that it's easier. So like, I think there was a time 4G was already working well in Kigali then, you know, when I would come to Ireland, I would be like, my signal goes back to 3G, where, where Rwanda it's on 4G, right? So yeah. they've been focusing on making sure that there is coverage in different areas and that people can access technology. And um, one thing that they are focusing on also is making sure that the services are accessible online. So all the government services, there is the unified a uh, platform called Irembo, which allows people to actually, you know, any documents, getting a passport, getting an ID or renewing your driving license, that kind of stuff. They've just developed services online that allow people to access them quite easily. And the good thing is that they are not focusing only on people who have, you know, smartphones. So they're making sure that even the person who has that small phone that can connect to internet can use it using U USSD, which is like a like a, a technology that allows you to use data over uh, the connectivity of your network. So you just need to be able to access an access point from your mobile network. And then that part manages the internet connection, but you as a user, you get the experience of, you know, uh, of what you need. So many services are moving online like that, and that's really enabling things to develop. And then with mobile money coming in and allowing, you know, payments through the use of mobile, it's making things quite easier. I think. Good stuff. That's a lot of good. I think we're going to be hearing a lot about Rwanda in the future. I think they've uh, they're developing very strongly and developing very well. And as you said, like they're pushing ahead of European countries, like so they're going to be the standard bearers of the African tech scene for a long time, I think. Uh, just a quick question, actually. Um, something I'm very interested in is we we I like a lot of people would sort of think of Africa as a large, you know, one very homogenous country almost mm -hmm. but it's actually uh, split into francophone africa anglophone africa and lucophone africa and then also north africa as well 
Yeah. So it's actually uh, so, but and you mentioned that Rwanda sort of switched from being a francophone country to an anglophone country. How is that sort of like countries that are just right beside you, like Rwanda is just right beside Uganda? Is there yeah. big sort of cultural barriers like that in the way? Um, you know, actually, so for Rwanda, we actually have Rwandan, Kenya Rwanda, which is our main language and which is spoken by everyone. So French yeah. and English are second and third languages that come, you know, on top. Okay. All for administration and, you know, uh, interaction with it, like other international countries. Um, but so um, I think in general, in Africa, there are just so many languages and most of the time languages and dialects. And most of the time what unites us is a foreign language because then, you know, take the example of Congo, uh, the, the Republic of Congo, which is next to Rwanda. I think they have more, I, I can't recall the number exactly, but you know, it, it's definitely more than 50 different dialects. So for people to be able to connect and to talk um, uh, together, they need to use French and that becomes like the main language. Uh, and then um, that's a good thing is that most of the, not most, but like a big number of African countries were colonized by either the French or the Belgians who speak French, which makes uh, communication easier between those countries using that language. And then we have on the other side, you know, the English speaking countries like South Africa, Zimbabwe, and then you go up to Kenya and, you know, those countries, they've used also English as, the main language that allow them to communicate and we can interact quite easily. And actually above those have developed communities of you know, countries speaking French, countries speaking English, which would have more ties economically and you know, even on the aspects of migration and communication mm. in the countries. Um, but um, I feel now people and those countries have come to understand that there is a need to actually, you know, even if there are different countries that are spoken, different languages that are spoken, like the, the main thing is that we are all Africans and mm -hmm. we can work together. So uh, there is really a big drive around unifying Africa in a way that it can become a, a big market, like a unified yeah. market. So I think you've heard of is CFTA, I, I don't know if I say it well, <laughs> the community of African um, countries that want to be a global market and make it easier for, you know, trade, for, you know, uh, travels, for everything to be quite easier within those countries. And that's, I think, a big step forward, you know, for the languages, to be honest, I don't think the language is a barrier because they, they can always be translations and so on. Okay, yeah. I even don't think culture would be a very though you know sometimes we have different differences in the culture but they're often you know it's culture is richness it's not yeah you know, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't block the the communication and the part of working together um so i think um the only thing is that in terms of development sometimes you can see different, you know, English speaking countries may be developing more faster than the other ones because, uh, you know, when you're looking at, you know, events or like collaborations and so on, or even trade, sometimes, you know, if English is the main one that is put forward, then the other countries might that don't speak, don't use that language might be not left out, but sometimes, you know, even being aware of opportunities and participating in those opportunities can come a little bit later. But I think at this point, um, I, when I look at the trend in French speaking countries in Africa, the trend is also to use English. You know, some okay. countries are adopting English as a second, third language. And also you can see it with young people, like, you know, the young generation is much into learning English, using English as well. Uh, so I think, you know, as as long as we see these languages as not something that separates us, but something that okay. we can learn both to develop forward, mm. I think it will be quite, uh, quite good. Yeah. 
Great stuff. That's that's been a load. We've been talking for ages and you've given us a lot of great insights. I think we better leave it there, actually, because there's just so much material and so much to think about. Yeah. So uh, thanks very much, Nick Gates, And I really appreciate like the, the amount of uh, the amount of time you spent on this. Um, uh, so we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I'm just going to stop recording now. It was lovely to talk to you.